All right, thanks for attending my talk on building and optimizing VR in Unity. Uh, my name's Corey Johnson. I'm on the product management team at Unity. Uh, what that means is it's my job to talk to basically all of you, um, get your feedback, figure out what you guys need most, and figure out what we can be doing that's the most beneficial to you, and help kind of prioritize and figure out um, yeah, what, what our guys should be doing to help you uh, the most efficient way. So I've been in the industry a little over 11 years. Uh, I've done a lot of different things. I've pretty much tried to code on every system except for audio. Um, I like doing gameplay. Uh, my technical areas that I focus on in Unity are graphics, uh, VR and AR, and like uh, performance areas. Um, and that's my email. If you, I, don't, I didn't put it at the end, so if you want to email me, feel free. Um, but it's just my first name, at Unity3D. So that's a little bit about me. So how about a little bit about you? How many people here are actively using Unity? Show of hands. Oh, all right, good. Uh, how many people here are actively making VR content? All right, cool. So what am I gonna talk about today? Um, I'm gonna talk about the Unity VR workflow. I guess it's over here. Uh, I'm gonna talk about like how to get started, what is actually happening when we do it. I'm gonna talk about some design stuff. So I talk to a lot of VR teams and we see a lot of common things that we see. So I'm not gonna get heavy into design because like there's like 17,000 VR conferences with design talks and uh, I'm not that guy. So, but I wanna, I wanna point out some common things and some of them will be pretty obvious, but like it's things we actually see people doing. Um, and so we just want to uh, kind of rehammer them home. And then I'm going to talk about optimizations. We all know performance and the stable frame rate is important. So uh, I'll talk about some optimizations that uh, we see people not doing that we think they should. Uh, so let's get started with workflow. Uh, the VR workflow, the good thing is it's exactly the same workflow that you build any 3D uh, Unity application in. So if you guys are already using Unity, you guys already know how to make VR apps. Um, the only difference and the only thing I will point out that I see a lot of like people going to VR for the first time is make sure that your assets are all on a scale of one meter equals one unit. Um, that's what Unity assumes one unit is in real world space. And so you don't wanna like drop a toaster in your scene and see it's the size of a Buick or something like that. Um, and this can be an issue if you are getting things from, say, the asset store or something like that, where you're like, oh, I'm gonna buy this flower, I'm gonna put it in my thing. Uh, just make sure you have something, like it's in your process to check the scale of that thing, because like, artists like to like, go in there and like, build like, a flower at like, 10 meters tall, just so they have the control and, and the fidelity, but um, build everything to one scale and make sure that scale is one, one meter to uh, one unit. Uh, we, I will be talking about it later. We do have Editor VR, um, I'm gonna talk about it uh, towards the end of the talk and kind of about what, what, what it does. Um, so the editor workflow will, or sorry, the VR workflow will change a bit and we'll get into that later. But so let's say you have an awesome uh, Unity Chan dance party app and you wanna make it VR. What do you actually need to do? Uh, well, you just check this button in your player settings, uh, virtual reality supported, and build and deploy and ship it, that's fine, that's it. Um, now I'm sure most of the people here have actually built a game before, so uh, there are some stuff that needs to happen, and that's what the rest of the talk is. Um, we do try to make it as easy as possible, so we, we literally say you check that checkbox. You'll get a virtual reality SDK's uh, drop down. you press the plus button, and add whatever platforms you want to support for, and that, that list will change whether or not you're on mobile, like Android, you'll have Daydreaming Cardboard, on PC, you'll have these options here. Um, and then you can rearrange this list and whatever, whatever this list order is in, uh, that is the order that we will try to initialize the SDK in. So in this case, it'll try to look for an Oculus and if it doesn't, it'll try to open, do open VR. So you can build a fat executable that supports both and ship it or you can have specific uh, per platform. So that workflow works with all of our partner platforms. Um, uh, as you can see here, these are the ones we have announced. We have some more um, that we'll be announcing, obviously, in the future, because uh, we try to be everywhere you want to be. Um, and what that means is it just works. You literally check that check button, and you don't have to do anything else. You could then hit the play button, and as long as you have um, one of, like, an Oculus or Vive onto, on your PC, you throw your headset on, and your camera is going to be tracked and things like that, and it, it just works. 
Um, there's obviously some other workflow stuff like uh, input and stuff like that, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So for those of you that aren't working on one of our partner platforms, obviously we still want to support them. And since most of you here are uh, Unity users, you guys know about our plugins and our asset packages. Uh, so what that means is that anybody who's making a VR headset, um, hopefully they're using OpenVR because then it just works and it works as a supported platform because we support OpenVR, which is what uh, SteamVR, I guess I should have pointed that out. So yeah, so I have uh, OpenVR right there and that's, that's just what SteamVR is as we all saw in many talks this t yesterday. Uh, but what that means is that uh, anybody that's making their own custom hardware and stuff like that, um, Usually they will make a Unity package for you, uh, and that handles things like giving you the right uh, shader that warps for the lenses, it handles like setting up a dual uh, camera system that's set up and with like IPD from their whatever, however they want their users to set it. Um, so it's, it's usually trivial, but if it's not that much harder if you need to do it yourself. So <clears throat> what, uh, what options does, does that allow you to do once you check that button? So basically on your camera, you get these, these new options here, these three of them, stereo separation, convergence, and target eye. And uh, what those do, so if you're doing stereo separation, that's basically your IPD, your interpupillary distance. Um, usually you don't wanna set that. Most platforms will have a user way of setting that and set that for you. Um, but if you wanna have some way to override that, you just throw some UI and that's what you need to, to over, override and that the user can set their IPD. Uh, stereo convergence is only if you're doing a stereo 3D monitor or TV. So most of you won't do that because that's not technically VR. Um, but just so you know, it's the depth at which into the, in past the, the plane of the, the monitor that the convergence is actually happening. Um, and if you know what that means, then you can play with that. If you don't, then don't worry about it. Uh, and target eye is the fun one, the one that you'll play with. Uh, default is both, which means you're rendering uh, from that camera, the, the head, where the camera position is now like the player's head position, and you're rendering to both eyes, so you're gonna do a stereo standard VR display. Uh, you can set that to uh, left, right, or none as well. And uh, left or right is if you wanna do something like render two different things to different eyes or uh, play around with something or you want to make them look like they're looking through a telescope so you shut one eye off and give them a cool effect, uh, whatever you want to do with it. Uh, the cool one is if you set it to none, then that camera is no longer a stereo camera and that camera is going to render to whatever the main display is. So if you're doing something and you want to have some kind of asynchronous gameplay and you want to like have a different viewpoint that the person who's sitting at the actual PC with the mouse keyboard is looking at, then you'll just say, okay, the camera that's rendering that is set to none and then you can control that. And it's a good way if, if somebody's, uh, you know, because everyone's watched the VR demos and they're like, people are like, whoa, it's crazy. And like the people outside are just like, I don't want to watch that, I can't see what's going on. Well, you could give them another camera um, and especially viable on PC because, you know, you're, you're rendering another camera, but uh, on, a, on today's PC, that's usually pretty okay. And it can be a better experience for people that are watching people play VR. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, there's some other settings that you're gonna set, and I thought I disabled this slide, but I'll talk about it now then. Um, the other settings that you wanna set are uh, graphics jobs experimental and single pass stereo rendering. So single pass stereo rendering will be on by default and just leave it there, unless you're doing something very uh, specific that you don't want it, like you're making your own uh, hardware and you don't want us to, to try to do anything, but basically what it does is every time that you go do a draw call, there's all sorts of setup work on the CPU to set up everything, and then it passes it up to the GPU and the GPU draws it. And so what we do is basically the single pass serial rendering does all that work once for each draw or for each frame. And then at the very last second, as late as we can, we say, by the way, instead of just rendering this object once, we're gonna render it once from here and once from here, but we share all the things uh, up to there. Um, it also shares culling between the eyes. We create one giant frustum that encapsulates both eyes, so we do culling once, and we also share uh, a shadow pass. Uh, graphics jobs, um, you probably want, especially on Vive. Um, what that does is it's our newer uh, pure mode renderer and uh, it's basically a newer way that we do multi-threaded rendering that runs uh, faster, and it works for like DX12 and Vulkan. Uh, for older APIs, you'll want to test it and make sure, because you might want to just stick with our old multi-threaded renderer 
um, which is another checkbox that will be soon be replaced by a drop down anyway. But uh, yeah. Okay, so I mean that's the workflow. Um, there's some other stuff like you know I'm gonna talk about it kind of in the design side, which is like you know setting up your inputs and stuff like that. But uh, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about design, <clears throat> and I'm going to try to con weave like a, a a theme of consistency uh, throughout this part, and we'll see how successful I am because I haven't done this talk before. And to kind of demonstrate and kick it off easy with consistency, I'll start off with our old friend Gravity. Um, this is one that everyone in this room should know. Um, and what I mean by consistency is like no matter what you show your user, like <laughs> you, no matter what he's hearing, whatever he's showing, whatever you have him doing, Gravity is always telling him that he's standing and just Gravity's pulling down. That's it. Um, so you need to kind of maintain some consistency with that fact. So an area where we see this, we see a lot of apps that, you know, have high speed car chases or roller coasters and things like that. And all of a sudden you have this like turn. And what happens when you turn really fast in your car? Uh, I've driven around here, so I know you guys know, uh, you get pulled outside by centripetal force, right? And your inner ear won't feel that. You're only going to feel down. So if you need, you want to try to avoid situations like that, or at the very least, have them in like a spaceship or a plane where that that turn can be a bank. Because uh, then, when you bank the player, then their body should think, "Oh, I'm, I should feel that force," but it's still kind of more in line with down, um, and it's just something to avoid. And of course, I'll just cover all the basics. You know, always maintain head tracking, um, even in pause menus. Uh, fade to black if you use HMT tracking for any reason. Uh, don't put your users on small watercraft. I've seen that. that uh, I don't get sick very often. I do a lot of VR, but uh, being on a rowboat in the ocean uh, did not help uh, that situation. So keep a steady horizon. Um, don't ever override the camera with scripts. Uh, always just let the tracking control the camera. Uh, and going along with gravity, uh, realize that people don't feel velocity. People only feel acceleration. Uh, what that means is uh, if you're, again, in a car or a plane and you feel the takeoff, you get pressed back into your seat, but once you get up to full speed and uh, steady speed, you don't feel like you're moving at all. Uh, remember that, because that's what the brain is telling them, is that they're not moving. So if you have them driving in a really fast car, um, that's okay. But what you don't want is to have really fast, slow acceleration. You don't want them like going slow and have this feeling of building up. Just try to get them to their constant velocity as fast as possible. Um, yeah. <clears throat> focus. Uh, you want to maintain a consistent focus range. Um, this is an image I found on the internet. I credited in my slides, which I'll, I'm sure I'll make available. Uh, and basically, it's the heat map of where people are looking in VR. And as you can see, for the most part, they look straight ahead, which is a good thing, because um, we don't want to tire them out. Uh, they drift a little bit when there's a little thing. But the human eyes tire really easily. They like to stay focused on just looking straight ahead and kind of at a constant distance. And what that means is you want to make sure that the things that you're asking them to focus on, especially rapidly, is stays within this two to five meter range in front of them. Uh, you don't, want them to, you don't want to do things where it's like, oh, check out way back there, because not only looking into the distance, you lose stereo perspective anyway. Um, but if you have them look way in the back of the room and then focus in the front and then look way in the back, their eyes will literally get tired from focusing because it's still muscles pulling and stuff like that. So uh, try to keep their focus in that two to five meter range, which uh, as we probably all know, that's the best range to reach text at as well. Um, so it's a good thing. Uh, another thing about text, you know, we all know it's notoriously hard to render in VR. So try to keep it vertical, plain to the player within that distance. Like, don't, don't have anything that relies on them reading something that's laying down on a table from a distance because you're going to have a bad time. Input. Um, there's a couple things to talk about here. Um, you know, obviously, we have this new input paradigm of track controllers, which is amazing. Um, it's not that dissimilar from, say, you're developing a mobile app and a PC app at the same time. So you have this par completely different paradigms. You have a touch interface, you have a mouse keyboard interface, uh, and now we have this hand tracked interface as well. So you'll want to do the same tricks that you do um, for 
for, for the you know, mobile PC, which is abstract all your input. So instead of having your code say, when, the you know, when this button is pressed, you know, add a force to the player to make him jump, you want to have your code say, when this button is pressed, send a message to the player to tell him to jump, and then the player just says, oh, you want me to jump, I'll add this force. Uh, and then it's really easy to swap out different uh, input types. Um, jump is probably not the best example because it's head track VR, so they'll just, you'll just tell them to jump and they'll literally jump. Um, probably not a good idea in VR as well. But uh, The other thing about input is that uh, this is a really good way to innovate. Uh, these are my friends at Alchemy Labs, a uh, way you exit their game. Hopefully you've all played it. And they have the exit burrito. And I'm really hoping this becomes a standard. So just, uh, just uh, have an exit burrito. Um, yeah. Uh, one more thing I'll put in here since I'm talking about kind of input is uh, humans are really good at standing. I bet if someone paid me, I could stand here all day. Um, what I couldn't do is like flail my arms about all day because I don't work out at all. Um, so if I had to like say point a lot and just hold my finger pointing, like after a couple seconds, I'm already going to dip down. So remember that. Similar thing with the eyes. Their arms are going to get tired. So try not to have something, unless it's, you know, you can do it. Like I've seen some awesome like lightsaber battles and sword fights and like, you know, uh, audio shield and stuff like that. It's fun. But just keep in mind that you're going to need to give them rest and stuff like that. Um, because, yeah, we're lazy. Remember, remember when the Wii came out and we're all like, yeah, it's amazing. And now you're just like playing tennis. And you're like, oh. yeah, like, uh, Humans are lazy. Uh, make sure you give them agency in the world. So uh, make sure you hand tracks is, be is best. So um, which is awesome because you know as I'm super happy that uh, you know Valve announced that they're making it easier for people to make hand tracks uh, items and things like that. Um, make sure you do the hands at a minimum. Don't worry about the rest of the body yet. We see people do a lot of like full body avatars and things like that. They don't. Like, IK systems don't know the difference between this and this, so the chance of you breaking and not matching up with reality and just giving them something to, to realize that with is, is too great at this point. There's tons of people, maybe in this room, like building things that will help that. Um, but in general, um, you know, hands and head tracking are, are pretty much all that's needed. Um, I, I think, I personally believe we'll get, we'll get better uh, relatively soon and it'll be great, but uh, for now, don't do it. The other problem is we see a lot of things where they give you an avatar, like you'll be at a, in a seated experience in a cockpit and so they give you the whole body and like, you know, you're grabbing onto like controls or something so it can match up, but then you look down and you see inside your chest and it's like really ghostly and, and uh, luckily it's not anatomically correct, otherwise that might be better, worse, I don't know. Um, but, you know, just make sure you don't, don't worry about it. Um, yeah, uh, hands are usually the best. Um, they're cross-platform. That means you don't have to worry about designing, oh, am I going to show them the, the touch controllers? Am I going to worry about showing them the, the, the Vive controllers? Don't worry about it. You, they, you, they just see hands, and they're abstract, and they relate to the uh, people, and it's slightly better for immersion. Uh, but most of the platforms give you the CAD models, so you can do really nice stuff with showing them the controller. Uh, one thing about not having a body, one thing that you expect to see when, you, when, you, when you're standing, if I look down, um, you know, besides the fact that I'm annoyed that it's raining and I had to wear pants today, uh, I kind of know where I am. I know how close I am. I know how far I can step up to this object because I know where I am in the world. Um, so try to give them some semblance of that. We see a lot of people that don't give that at all. So give them a little blob shadow that kind of is like, hey, this is the area you're taking up. Uh, do little feet prints that kind of show this is the area you're, you're at, this is kind of where you're facing. So if you step forward, you know, I kind of kind of know where I am in the world. Um, and it helps really ground me when I look around because that's all I really care about when I look down is like, yeah, there's ground, I'm here, where is everything, right? Um, this is a really good way to uh, maybe show people, depending on how you're going to locomote, you can show them the path that you're actually going to move the camera on. If you're going to do that, it's probably not a good idea. But like, uh, you can say, oh, you're going to kind of go around over there, and it kind of shows them, hey, if I do this, this is where I go in the world. And it gives them that connection back to like, hey, I know how to walk, and I know how to get there. And if you tell them that, so they still have that same feeling. 
Uh, one last thing is, is VR ghosts. And I'm not talking about like rendering and, and, and like pixel uh, response time or anything. I'm talking about interactable objects. Um, VR is really novel right now. Like everyone is just like, this is amazing, I'm in this world, and suddenly the most inane things that like in an old school first person shooter that would, they would walk right past are the most amazing things in the world right now. I'm like, oh look, there's a mug, I can do things. And like, they're gonna do it. Like at some point, somebody's gonna interact with everything in your world. So keep that in mind and you know, don't put stuff there if it's not interactable. Um, so this has big, uh, you know, big costs on you know CPU budgets and stuff like that. Um, try to avoid things that are concave right now, like like this mug. Like doing this in VR is really hard because it's a physics object. It means I have to have multiple physics objects right now to like do that and swirling it around uh, and allowing them to do intricate interactions like that highlights the fact that today's physics engines are approximations and even you know. You know, if they do something too fast and things over collapse, their, their human brain is going to pick that out in a second. So, uh, the other one of this thing is like, if you have like a background character just going about their business doing something, like some lady gardening over off to the side, and they walk up and be like, hey, start kicking her and just pass through her and nothing happens, like that's immediately going to like break immersion and make them feel like it's not there. So like, try to avoid uh, things. I saw uh, a demo that we did and. Uh, we didn't uh, end up releasing it, but like one of the things that happened was uh, a guy came up and talked to your character, so he was interacting with me, but then if I was over here, he was still talking to over there, and it was just like, oh, okay. So um, if you're gonna have situations like that, make sure you're tracking where the player is, especially in room scale, because they can be standing anywhere, and react to that. So the last thing I wanna talk about is reality. Reality stays really smooth and consistent. Like, you know, we have this concept of deja vu where we notice, like, something our brain is telling us something's off. Um, <clears throat> reality doesn't slow down unless you're on drugs. Uh, it doesn't stutter, and, you know, hopefully. Um, which brings me to my next section, which is optimizations. So, uh, again, those were just some design things that we see people do a lot when we go and I try a lot of VR stuff, and it's just like, oh yeah, you, you shouldn't have done that, and I see it a lot, so I just, hopefully you guys have heard of all before, but like, if you haven't, like, hopefully you learned a little bit of something. So, everyone here knows that performance is really important, we need to maintain 90 frames per second, um, which is, you know, less than two years ago, it was like 60 frames a second, and now, you know, we have to be at 90 frames a second while we're rendering everything twice, so what are some things that you can do to make sure you maintain a solid steady frame rate? Um, yeah, so uh, I already talked about these. Uh, single pass rendering, uh, use a new graphics shop experimental. Uh, they can have a monumental effect on your performance, so I'll just reiterate, check those boxes if you can. Um, uh, you will be happy. Uh, in general, don't do things more than once. Um, I mean, we're already rendering everything twice, so everything you can do to uh, limit the amount of time that, or amount of times that you do any kind of processing is better. So don't use image effects, um, with the exception of anti-aliasing. So I'll talk about that. So uh, as you probably know, image effects go through every pixel on the screen. And uh, nowadays, it's like everyone wants a 4K monitor. We're talking about 8K monitors, and it's like 5K TVs or some, something ridiculous. Uh, so there's a lot of pixels to do that. So uh, if you do that, that means you have to do it uh, twice, because you're going to have to do it for each eye. Um, and that's bad. Our new cinematic image effects does support um, VR, and they do do some smart things to make some of these viable. And we are uh, most of the people here. I'm assuming you're probably doing like PC-based, uh, high-end PC-based stuff, um, and so you can get away with doing image effects. So, so I should point out that nothing I'm saying here is like an absolute. Like if you're like, well, I kind of need to do that. Like feel free. Uh, my point here is that just knowing that everything has a cost and pay where you actually get the most bang for your buck. Uh, so the one thing I will accept with that is always use anti-aliasing. Uh, just sitting there staring at me, uh, your head's m moving microscopically, you're, you know, you're like twitching or hemming or hawing or something like that, so your head's always moving. And what that means is since your head is being tracked, uh, all the jaggies from aliasing, that you know, the, the, the crawl, will always be crawling and it's gonna be very apparent. And you know, it's like, again, we don't wanna make them think they're on drugs. Unless you do, 
but uh, I, build whatever you want. So uh, always make sure you have anti-aliasing on because it helps with the jaggies. Um, that's the one exception to that rule. Everything else, just make sure that you can, um, uh, you, you know what you're doing. Uh, reduce draw calls. Uh, as I said, we, we single pass rendering uh, shares draw calls um, and, and we do as much as we can. Uh, but everything you can do to reduce, like using LEDs in the background, uh, make sure you have culling turned on. You wouldn't, you'd be surprised how many people I go that like turn culling off for some reason and they just never turned it on and you're like, no, like you want to cull. Like there's no reason to render things that you can't see. Uh, standard stuff, Atlas textures and share materials, you know, have one big material and one, at, uh, one big atlet or texture and one material that you share amongst m multiple objects. Uh, one caveat I see people get bit by a lot is make sure you optimize your light maps. So if you mess around with your light map um, resolution, you end up with multiple light maps. And what that means is that half of your objects uh, could be on this side of the room and half of them could be on this side of the room. And if, we ha have a, if I have a seam, a light map seam in the middle, that means those can no longer be batched because light maps, when you're using, especially when you're using the standard shader or maybe even your own shader, when you use light maps, like that counts as part of the textures in the batching process. So you can actually break batching by, uh, you know, having a light map seam and people don't realize that. So they're like, why are these things not batching? Uh, and it could be because your light maps, they're on two different light maps and that will, cause them to have two draw calls. Um, reduce skin meshes. Um, static lighting, um, you know, I, I have a feeling that most of these things will be obsolete when we, when we hopefully come back next year, or hopefully not in two and a half years when they have another Steam Dev Days. But uh, for now, like static lighting, everything that's static is best. You don't have to dynamically generate stuff. It saves you a lot of time. So use uh, blob or no shadows. Um, use our light probe system. Um, if for those of you who don't know what light probes do, they basically sample the lighting conditions at a specific point in space, and you make a grid of those for, uh, encompassing your world. And then as dynamic objects walk through, uh, we basically sample the, the, the cell they're in, and it looks like a little pyramid, and we say, okay, what are our lighting conditions? And then we apply the lighting uh, to that object based on that, so you can get some dynamic uh, things moving in and out of shadows uh, without actually having to have dynamic lights. Um, avoid CPU spikes, um, that means garbage collector spikes. Um, so, you know, all the standard stuff, use object pooling, um, don't instantiate objects. Uh, um, yeah, like, if you want to know more, I can go into more detail during the question and answer portion, but uh, yeah. Uh, think about using coroutines if you have like long, super long things. Uh, you know, maybe break that up over a couple frames using coroutines. Co uh, for those of you who don't know, coroutines are a way to time slice uh, like an algorithm. So you basically say, I want to do a little bit of work and then I'll wait and then I'll do a little bit more work. So if you're doing things like calculating enemy paths to the player or something like that, where it's like, oh, if the enemy doesn't react within like, you know, three frames, like the player won't notice, like calculate that over three frames. I will say, you know, Profile and make sure you know what you're doing with coroutines. They do generate some memory, um, and so use them sparingly. Reduce render texture updates. Um, if you have anything that's like, you know, the arena cam that's like in the background, you know, uh, make sure that you don't, you know, if, if you don't have to update it every frame, like maybe have that running at 30 frames a second while you're at 90. Um, depending on how like actual visual and how much time your players actually spend looking at it. Uh, render textures are a, f are a full render, so they're very costly. Um, consider simplifying your visuals, fewer objects, lower poly meshes, use high res textures to kind of give them more detail, flat shading. Like, um, uh, I think a good point was made in the keynote where it was said that, uh, you know, for us, like, I mean, People don't actually care how super realistic we all know about Uncanny Valley and the closer you get to it, and especially in VR where they feel like they're standing in it, they're gonna just notice it's faster. Um, but so like, you know, make them cartoons, make them whatever. Again, as long as it's consistent, as long as you don't change that up, and as long as like you say this is what gravity feels like and gravity stays that way, then you know, everything's all good. So consider using flat shading unless you're doing some architectural stuff and obviously you wanna have some real realness. Um, profile. This is something I, I literally go to many studios and I'm like, oh, what does it say in the profiler? And they're like, what? Um, 
profile, profile, profile. It, like All your answers are in profiling. So make sure you use our profiler, which will help you find things like where you're generating memory. You can um, take a snapshot, sort by you know what's generating the most garbage and clean that up. Um, and you can you know find places where you want to use maybe a, a non-allocating version or find some place where you're you have a thing where you're passing a you know a name of a state uh, by string uh, and you can swap that out with an integer so you save a bunch of memory and, and don't get garbage collected as often uh, things like that. Um, use our frame debugger. Our frame debugger lets you figure out what's being drawn in what order and it'll help you find where you're breaking batching. Um, you'll find things like why is that thing being rendered right now that doesn't need to be rendered and, and figure that stuff out um, and you can help you like optimize your shaders and things like that. Uh, I believe this is my last point uh, is dynamic performance. Um, like I said, everything I said was, is, isn't, isn't like don't do this or, or you're doing it wrong. It's like if you're doing these things, they have a heavier price than, than you may think um, and so take that into consideration. Uh, but one thing I can say is like a lot of people think is like, oh, I gotta be doing this and I have to hit this performance profile and that has to be steady throughout the whole experience. Um, well, you, you can ch pick and choose. Like if you have a monster busting into, the, into the, the wall and stuff like that, you can pick and choose your battles and you know, uh, you know depend you obviously test, but like you can turn on more particle f effects. You can have like more image effects on while they're just focusing on that, and then like shut a bunch of stuff off behind them as long as they're not looking. You know, as you know, and so it, don't think that you have to have a same performance profile throughout the entire, you know, thing. Uh, if you're doing any kind of mobile, this is especially true because on on mobile performance equals heat and battery life, um, and so again you can trade those off for uh, awesome effects if you want. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is a uh, roadmap. This is really high-level stuff. Uh, I'm not going to give any dates or anything like that. Um, but uh, the first thing I'll talk about is Editor VR. Um, Editor VR is a way for you to stay in your headset, um, move, manipulate, you know, instance new objects into the world, um, place them, uh, enter and exit play mode, things like that. Um, we're going to be announcing stuff soon. So uh, uh, stay very attentive in the next few weeks um, for information about that. Uh, but our goal with Editor VR is to help you with your iteration times. Um, I will say that we are, are making it you know, very configurable so you'll be able to add your own tools into it and things like that just like you can with the editor. Um, I personally think it's going to be really good for uh, iterating on the feel that your player is going to have. Um, my, my example is like you have a, f a creepy forest scene um, that your player's going to walk through or sanding in. You're not going to place every tree, although you can because it's easy. They have the chessboard, which uh, we'll show off soon. Um, but you'll, you'll use standard practices. We have tools for like painting trees into the scene and stuff like that. But what you are going to do is you're going to find that one tree that's supposed to be imposing and big and make them feel small and scared. And you're going to stand there and be like, that needs to be bigger okay, move it a little bit closer, maybe too far, too close, you know. And you're going to be able to fine-tune things like that without having to leave VR, edit it, go back in and, and repeat that. You can just be like, oh, this is what feels good and do it. And that's, and that's the goal of Editor VR. Uh, we have a VR interaction kit we're working on. Um, these will be things like uh, components that you just drop on objects that say, I'm a tracked object and I'm um, being tracked by the left left hand or right hand or you know I'm also doing you know whatever so we want to make it super easy for you to not have to worry about what input device you're on like obviously there's a ton of new input devices here so um, we're not gonna be able to do everything but you know saying this object is tracked by this um, is will be a lot easier and you know being able to make uh, input that maps to both the touch controllers and the Vive controllers uh, will be kind of done. And like figuring out what kind of input do you want. Like if I'm holding an object and I put put my hand through the table, how do I want that to react? Well, you will we'll have like three different interaction modes, and you can kind of do stuff. Again, we'll be announcing that uh, very soon. Uh, that is also being built on our new input system that's coming, which is uh, a lot better than our old one. Which I'm sure I don't have to tell you because uh, the old one's pretty. Old. Let's leave it at that. Um, the new input system is really good because it allows people to plug in. Hey, here's my hardware, and I'm sending this data. 
Um, and you can read that data raw, or you can kind of get interactions out, and you can kind of say, like, I just want to care about when the fire button is pressed. And then potentially the hardware people could provide you with a, a little plugin that like plugs into the input system so you don't have to do anything. Um, there's also a gesture recognizer, so like somebody can define like, oh, this means circle gesture, this is star gesture, uh, and it will, people can provide interpreters for like, for you, um, and it'll be pluggable and open source, so that's good. Uh, performance, we're always looking at performance and, and things like that. Um, specifically, I can say we've partnered with NVIDIA and AMD to integrate VRWorks and Liquid VR, so uh, early next year you'll see implementations of that uh, hopefully rolling out and getting into uh, uh, your hands a little bit. Um, other performance things we're investigating is, you know, usually per platform, and we work a lot with all of our partners to make sure that, you know, we're optimized for their platforms and things like that. And we're investigating things like foveated rendering and stuff like that, but we're not 100% sure like where the best gains are yet. So, and lastly, uh, improving mobile workflow. And again, this kind of goes back to editor VR. And but specifically on mobile, you have to build, deploy it to the tethered device, unplug it. Uh, put it into the whatever device, put it on your head, no, that doesn't work, repeat, uh, or undo, and then repeat. Uh, so we're, we're actively looking at ways to improve that iteration speed. Um, yeah, so uh, there's probably other stuff. If you have anything specific during the Q&A, feel free to ask. Uh, if you want, uh, we're gonna be raffling off a 12-month uh, pro subscription. So if you just go to there, it's case sensitive, and we'll send an email to the winner after the, the show's over. Um, it's just uh, bit.ly slash SDD, Steam Dev Days, uh, uh, dash SCA for Seattle, I guess. Um, everyone got that? All right, so thanks. Uh, I'll open up to questions. They're gonna have mic runners, so if you just raise your hand and I'll, this guy up front already has one, uh, and then I'll pick it out. And uh, I'll leave that up there while we're talking, so in case you didn't get it. Hey, uh, Hello. thanks, great talk. Um, I have a question, you mentioned light map optimization. Mm -hmm. How do you get objects to, how do you get objects to be in a certain light map or not? Um, so basically, you just have to play with the resolutions. Um, Usually you try to want to have your resolution so you just have like one big light map, but if you have like really high fidelity lighting or something like that, um, and you crank that up, um, other than like moving your whole world around kind of to, to, to match things up or move that seam, um, it's just about like, instead of like scaling up the entire uh, map, maybe just scale up individual objects in that map and try to get them to fit. Um, it's kind of a dark art right now. Um, so, yeah, okay. but, thanks. yeah. Cool. Uh, there's a guy over here. I'll just kind of weave my way back here. Right here, so, um, oh, dude, right. awesome talk. Um, Unity, Unity is amazing. Unity, right? Yes? Um, oh, stop. Dude, no, and you're, you, um, especially there's so much to learn, so much about optimization. Um, and when I check my profile, one of the things I see a lot is like the physics is taking up uh, a ton. And I think one of your other talks, you kind of talked about overriding the physics and doing some of that, um, you know, manually. And then you talk a little bit more about that and there's their code bases out and, and things like that. Sure. Um, kind of going back to my point that everything needs to be interactable. So again, like VR super novel, every single thing, like, that you can touch, they're gonna wanna touch. Um, so like, first of all, like don't put things like a pile of paper clips in your, in your scene because people are gonna wanna do crazy things like make a paper clip chain and your life is going to be very, very hard. Um, so that, that's the first thing. Uh, the other thing is if, if, you, if you just have um, simple physics, like if you, you know, you t locomote around and everything's animated around and you kind of push things in and out with animations and you don't actually need that much physics but some things drop, like, you don't have to use our physics component, like, gravity's, you know, 9.8 uh, and so you can just add that in and, and animate them yourself with your own scripts. Um, and if you do things like that, it allows us to strip out more of the code. Um, things that, uh, it's, for PC, it's less of an issue, um, but like for console stuff, we see a lot that you know um, physics on consoles can be really tough because it's very CPU bound and uh, can do that. So we're we're looking at that. I've had active discussions with our physics team. We're trying to figure out what we can do because like 
I think physics in general, as far as game technology, is due for a next step. Like we talk a lot about hardware and software and stuff, but you know, we need to talk about physics. Like you know, VR means that we want to have a lot more things that are dynamic. We want them to have a lot more accurate. And uh, I think it's just something that, as an industry we need to work on. Um, and I'm I'm working on getting us to to start working on that internally. Um, but for now, like I said, if you if you if you just have a thing where you're throwing a ball, like Gamedev.net will have that code. Go find it, build your own little plugin, and uh, optimize the heck out of it. And you won't have to deal with a lot of you know any you know, physics system worry about anything else. Um, and it, you can you can find some good optimizations there. So thanks. Uh, this gentleman right here. Yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, back, back. There you go. Um, thanks. Uh, what do you recommend for uh, targeting multiple uh, head-mounted displays in the same build? Um, I, I, you, you mentioned something about the order of the drop-down. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it really just depends on whether or not you want to manage multiple builds. Like, you can set your, you know, the... These startup costs will probably be pretty negligible over us saying, oh, this, this one SDK isn't there, so move on to the next one. Um, uh, since we're talking about PC, like the amount of install size doesn't matter either. So it's, it's really just whether or not like, you want a clean build for you're submitting to Steam that doesn't support Oculus or uh, supports Oculus only through OpenVR, uh, which is another possibility, or if you want to submit to Oculus Store and, you know, it, it d doesn't matter either way because they won't let you launch that from their store into you know a, an HTC Vive. So um, you might, if if you care enough about like you know the the meg or two megs that it might be for that SDK to come in your executable, you might just have a build that's Oculus only. Um, in general, you really just need to add the HMDs that you care about onto that list and in, instantialize uh, initialize it. And oh, actually, you don't have to do anything. Uh, check the box, add the SDKs, and ship it. Um, if you have like other things that aren't on the list that you need to support, then you'll need to write some code that says, oh, hey, you know, call the initialization to the SDK and, and stuff like that. And hopefully that's just a simple script that you uh, run on a startup object. But um, yeah, I mean, honestly, I, if you're talking about PC, I wouldn't worry about it at all. Um, just whatever you want to support, make sure you have it up there and in the list. And uh, the order, uh, the order only matters if you do one fat thing, because if what happens is if uh, you do OpenVR and uh, it might try to run the OpenVR version through uh, Oculus, because you know it's OpenVR, so it can support that. But um, so if, you might want to put Oculus first, just so like if you submit that build to Oculus, it'll run that way, and then if you submit that same build to Steam and they have a Vive, it, it'll still just work, and, and the player won't notice a difference. So. Uh, that guy in the white shirt, kind of in the middle, back, yeah, that guy with a black hat, back, back to the right. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I was wondering if you're going to be uh, putting any of the lab renderer uh, stuff into native Unity. Um, yes, uh, not in the way you think. So we have a feature coming up called scriptable render loops. And we've moved, we're moving all of the code that controls what the render loop setup is into C Sharp and making that open source. Um, and we've already implemented the lab renderer in this way. It's one of our, actually, it uh, was our first test case. Um, and what that allows, you know, uh, graphics engineers or platform owners, uh, it allows them to go ahead and um, customize the render pipeline however they want. Uh, and you know it's all open source, so that means if you wanted to write a forward plus uh, renderer, which we don't have, you know you could take our our forward um, render loop and add a couple you know a couple hundred lines of code, and there you go. Um, so yes, that'll be coming. Um, uh, our goal is to eventually make it so you don't need uh, any plugins from the platforms to just kind of work as best as possible. And we're working closely with uh, you know, Valve to, to make sure that happens. Um, in this case, that's the, the mechanism that'll come. Um, we have Unite in a couple weeks, and we'll be talking a lot more about scriptable render loops if you're interested. So um, they'll have sessions about how it works and stuff like that. So yeah. Thanks. 
Uh, this guy. Oh wait, sorry, the guy, the guy with the already has the mic. How about that guy? Thanks. Uh, so I have a question about profiling in VR. Sure. Uh, I'm working on a Vive game right now using mm -hmm. OpenVR, and uh, we've already started to run into performance issues. Uh, and it's just like gray box, very simple graphics. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I attach the profiler uh, on CPU, I see a very large, basically continuous spike saying like VR dot wait for GPU. It makes it sound like it's GPU bound. Mm -hmm. On the GPU, it just says other. And that's like the dominant factor basically most of the time. And it makes it very difficult to identify what the bottlenecks are unless I just like detach the profiler and just guess and check, turn stuff off and on. Right. So, um, off the top of my head, I don't remember what gets grouped in other. Uh, what I'll do is I'll take that feedback back, but what I would suggest is at the 11 o'clock session is uh, on the panel for the Vulkan render. Uh, Miko's here, and he's one of our rendering engineers. So I would grab him right after that talk and just browbeat him and just be like, what's up? Cool, thanks. Yeah. Throw them under the bus. Uh, somebody over here had their hand for a while. This dapper gentleman with the sport coat. Yeah, there you go. Is that a sport coat? Why do they call those sport coats? Like, I don't know. They're not. They're not I, I don't even know. Anyway, thank you for giving the talk. I, I think we all really appreciate it. Um, but you had mentioned something about uh, gestures in VR. Mm -hmm. uh, is that going to be something that's being added, or is that something that already exists? I haven't seen anything on it yet. Um, it, it's something that, like the new input system will have a, uh, a way for you to plug in gesture recognizers. And what those basically do is it's a way for you to write a little script that interprets the um, the raw data coming in, and then somebody, anybody who knows, can define uh, what a gesture means, uh, and they can basically pull the input over time, and then when they deem that they, a gesture has been reached, they can send an event. Um, so while we don't, I'm not saying that we're gonna add like, hey, they made a circle, uh, we're, adding the, we're designing the input system to make that super easy for somebody to say like, this is the threshold for making a circle. Um, and uh, so it, it will be added, but like it not, not necessarily by us. Uh, we, we hope that whoever is providing the input will have things uh, that will, will recognize like common gestures, especially if they're like involved in like the system in any way. Okay, so it'd be an additional plug-in on top of what you essentially already have or just a, a set of input criteria. Uh, it'll be uh, some scripts that you can write and drop in that plug into the input system. Like, the input system won't be a plugin. It'll just be some scripts and an API you can write against to say like, hey, I want to pull the data and I want to fire off this once this condition happens. Um, and it'll be super easy for that to be abstracted from anywhere in your code. So, you know, hopefully all your game code just says, oh, they, they cast a circles thing and uh, you don't have to worry about it. And it keeps it isolated again. And then if you are, you know, on a different platform, then that's, you know, because that could be hand tracked, but then you have the mobile version of the VR thing, which will probably be a thing in a year. Uh, you know, it could be like, oh, well, on this platform, that means I'm a, you know, touch, I look for touch events instead of 3D positions in the world. Um, and so we want to make sure that there's a good abstraction layer, and we're providing that. Um, and hopefully, you guys will fill in the holes, and it'll be really easy to just find, you know, open source like gesture recognizers out there. So awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, right up here in the front, and then we'll. Sweep back that way. Um, so one of the things that I saw is like the strongest part of job simulator was the interactions with objects and how smooth they were. Yeah. I'm wondering if those interactions are done through physically based interactions with the hand model or is it just when you're sufficiently close to a button, it just triggers an animation of the button being pressed. Like, what's generally the best way to do those really smooth, well-constrained interactions with, ob with objects? So, I actually talked to them about this, but I forget, so I don't want to talk to them. They're, Devin is here, maybe not in the room, but Devin and the Alchemy Labs guys are here, so, like, track them down and ask. Um, uh, there's a couple things, and, and the, the main concern is, again, like, what happens if I have an object in my hand and I put my hand through a wall or something that's immovable. Uh, there's a couple ways. So some people 
just make you drop it. And there's uh, some people, what they have is they have a joint, a physics joint. And like whenever you pick an object up, it just gets put on the joint. And that can be a spring joint. So there's like a, as my hand moves through, like the object sticks there. And if I, if I get to a, a certain point, I break the connection and it'll just drop. Uh, other things, that mean it'll just stay in. And then like as I, as I come back, if I came back over here, it would slide and kind of follow. Uh, other things just apply the force and then, then like wackiness happens. Um, it, it really is up to you and the feel that you want in your game. Um, so like as I said, like our interaction kit will actually have like a couple, like I think we have like three different options where you can say like, oh, this object is, is, is grasped and what does that mean? And like we'll, we'll, you can say like, I want a joint constraint and then you can play with the joint or you can want to say like, oh, I just want this thing to go, because the other thing you can do is just turn off the collider on this and this goes with me, but then if I let go of it outside the world, what happens? Like, you know, uh, so it, it's really up to you and, and, and the interactions that you have in your game. Um, the cheapest one would just be to turn off the, the collider and just update the position with the tracked hand, but then again, like people can drop things out, out of the world. So, um, but if, if you have a, a if you have a mechanism for dealing with that, or that's that's fine because like you can just generate new content and like fling things away. Like maybe you don't care, and so and because you're generating all that content, you want to have, you know, a, a way for them to get rid of it. Like fine. Um, again, so uh, we're going to provide you options, and it's really up to you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, we'll sweep by. This guy was ahead of you. I'm sorry. Is there two mics? Where's the other mic? All right. All right. We'll get somebody in the back, and then we'll come back. We'll ping back. Thanks. Um, rigid body sweep tests can be useful for that as well. Um, yes. Um, my question would be, do you have any suggestions for improving editor performance? Because what I've noticed is I've had to disable gizmos. I've had to hack up third-party assets that draw uh, custom scene views. Uh, not scene views, sorry, like toolbars. Mm -hmm. um, my frame update time in my game can be five milliseconds, and I still all drop frames like crazy without disabling some of that stuff. Um, I mean, no, the, the way to optimize is disable stuff, I guess, but, uh, I mean, we'd be interested if you could share your project, either through, like, email me, um, or, uh, submit a bug, I don't know how big your project is, um, it'd be interesting if you could test, uh, because if you email me, I can send you a script that will, like, strip out a lot of your assets, like, sounds and textures and stuff to make it packageable, and it would be interesting to test to see if it's, like, code things happening, or if it's just size of data, um, but we should definitely follow up um, and like get people looking at it to figure it out because we don't want we want the editor to be a smooth performance. So again, my email was Corey C R E Y at Unity. So email me and we'll, we'll follow up. Okay, thanks. Uh, did was somebody had a question in the back there? Maybe anywhere? That guy. That guy really wants to ask this question. <laughs> All right, on that uh, idea of the profiler and looking at you know trying different renders, trying different batching things. I wanted to have some quantitative way to compare the stuff. So I was trying to create a time demo that would fly the headset around in a certain pattern, but I, I couldn't, uh, you know, you can't, I couldn't take over for the tracking system. Is there any way to do that kind of like rigorous A B testing? Well, you can take over the tracking system, you just don't have anybody in the headset. And like only, only, because yeah. if, if you're only looking at the data and you're not actually experiencing it, that's fine. Like for this case, like yeah, that's that's a good use case to, to like fly the camera around and see what parts of the scene are are, are more costly. Um, that's fine. Just make sure you don't put one of your testers in the headset while they do it, because um, that would be bad. All right, I'll keep trying. <laughs> yeah, uh, let's go to this guy. So quick question, you mentioned how important AA was. I was just curious, uh, should we be using the camera script AA as well as the project quality settings AA together? Um, I would probably be using our latest cinematic image effects. Um, they're the most up-to-date, like technique-wise, the ones we've been actually actively working on. and. Uh, the one we spend the most time optimizing f with VR. So uh, those are the ones I would use. I would probably not use the quality setting ones and just use those. Thank you. In the back. Um, you mentioned talking about um, rendering performance um, in terms of triangles, uh, texture size, and batches. 
I'm just kind of curious, is there an order of like, if something's gonna be a little bit higher or like I'm making this higher so this one could be lower, what's a good order of like, are triangles better to have higher than texture size or does it really? Um, uh, no, um, it's something you'll need to play with, have your tech artists like play around with like what they can get away with. Uh, Everything, I mean, we're on PC, so triangles are, are pretty cheap, so. Um, That's kind of what I assumed was triangles are always the cheapest, but I wasn't sure if I was making a false assumption. Yeah, um, my, my advice is general kind of, because I can kind of include some mobile. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, yeah. On, on PC, I would probably say triangles are the, are the, the last one to optimize, but um, yeah, other than that, like, it really depends on, because every tweak you make is going to affect the look of your game, and that's something you're going to have to figure out what, where, to, where to pay the piper on that one. So. Okay, cool. Uh, real quick, you mentioned cinematic image effects. Is that just in the standard asset package? Or? Um, yes, yeah, so there will, uh, no, they're not in the standard asset package. Those are on the asset store as a separate package. They're also on GitHub open source, um, so you can download them. They're all open source as well. And uh, yeah, we just released the... Uh, what we call the Uber effect as well, so they're even more optimized. If you are gonna use multiple ones, we share passes between them, because before we had them all individual while we developed the techniques, and we just combined them all into one, one Uber effect, as we say, so that way if you're using, as you turn on, A, we ensure that they happen in the right, most efficient order, and then B, uh, we can share passes between them, so uh, they're a lot more efficient than, say, adding them individually, um, but they're all available open source or on the asset store as a package, and, uh, we're super proud of them. They look really great, and we have some of the best performance uh, out there right now because uh, we've spent a lot of work on them. So yeah. sorry. So the com the Uber effect is like combined image effects. Yeah. So it's and instead of, instead of having multiple scripts that you add to uh, the camera, you'll just have one script that you add, and then you can just turn on and off which effect. It works like oh, our I standard see. shader, where if you don't have an effect in there, we can we use the compiled version where we compile that out, and so it's it's optimized. And you'd still recommend just AA with that then, or play around? Um, on PC, like, I, I'm, I'm, I tend to be a little gun shy. On PC, like, you know, uh, you can probably get away with a couple other things, especially now that we've gone through and done some optimizations. But, you know, again, minimum is AA. Uh, it's still going to be a very expensive thing if you add anything else. But, it, again, it's, it's, it's your call whether or not that performance hit is worth it. Um, because if you have some like really cartoony flat shaded things where like you're in the land of cylinders and they're running around like sure like Why not bloom who cares? Uh, but if you if you don't then you know What you can get away with is up to you. Awesome. Thanks. Great talk. Thank you. I got one more question Maybe let's go this guy over here And then afterwards I'll be off to the side if anybody wants to continue asking questions or uh, outside I'll be right out there uh, yeah, what's the um, current suggested workflow for shipping a game with both VR and like traditional gaming support, like without having the uh, VR VR libraries being loaded up? Because right now, if you're trying to ship for something for like Open VR and without it, there's not really a good way to get the Open VR not to launch on every single run. Right. Um. That's a good point, because uh, yeah, so like basically you can control the VR supported by, by script, but if you don't have it checked in, it, it'll be stripped. So build it with it stripped and just have a really high precedent initialization script on an object that's in your first bootload scene or bootstrap scene, and just say, hey, shut that off. Um, oh, there you go, yeah, and there are, yeah, thanks, God. Uh, so yeah, so if you have VR supported and your camera, there you go, set it to none, and it'll be a standard camera, and you don't have to worry about it, and then once you go to turn on VR support, however you transition, uh, you just need to change your camera to both, and then you'll have a VR thing. Uh, obviously, like, uh, you'll need to worry about like the tracking and stuff, but um, yeah, that's the way to do it. All right, uh, that's my last question. Uh, I will be outside the room right out here if you have follow-up questions. Thank you very much.